Do you all have a laptop with you? Okay, so uh, if you do have a laptop, this is a workshop. You are welcome to follow along with me. If you do not have a laptop, there's no problem. You can watch me run the workshop and uh, you know, you can watch me live, which hopefully it's as close as uh, you do it yourself without a laptop. All right, let's get started and learn some EVPF together. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Lin Sa. I come from the United States. I live in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, North Carolina is a state uh, a little bit down Washington, D.C., Virginia, you know, somewhere between New York and Florida, if you know where New York and Florida is. Um, I have been a Istio contributor and one of the founding members of the Istio project, so been working uh, for the past six or seven years on the Istio project. I actually wrote two books about Istio. So right now I work at Solo, leading the open source development team. So by the way, um, apologies, I've been standing right here. And part of the reason is uh, there is an elevated section. I don't want to fall by walk, uh, back and forth. So I'll be standing here. Apologies, I actually don't like to stand behind the podium. So uh, I wrote two books about Istio, now working at Solo. Um, before I joined Solo, so when I joined Solo, that was a little bit over two and a half years ago. And before I joined Solo, I worked at IBM and uh, I was a master inventor at IBM, a fun fact about me. Uh, so right before I leave IBM the day, I took a screenshot of how many patents I contributed for IBM. So that's 207. Um, which means I was a co-inventor for these 207 patents, uh, which of course IBM owns them, but uh, it's nice to have my name on. So that's a little bit about me. Um, how many of you know of a small company, Solo Dial? All right, uh, one or two, thank you. <laughs> so uh, it was founded by Edith Loving uh, in 2017. So I joined Solo uh, in 2021, right in the middle of COVID, uh, when we were talking about, uh, you know, resign from jobs. I was part of the movement as well. Uh, I decided to try something new. So I had been working at IBM for like 19 years. I decided, you know, why not, uh, you know, try something new because stuck at home was very boring during COVID. Um, so we are a very fast growing company focused on API gateway, application network connectivity. Um, so uh, now we're going to jump into eBPF. So how many of you know what eBPF stands for? All right, uh, eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley uh, Packet Filter. Uh, eBPF is known to be very flexible. It can execute um, your extension customer logic inside of the kernel as a sandbox program, which is super cool, right? Because if you think about Linux kernel, right? It, the innovation of Linux kernel is not as fast as many people had hoped and also also, the fact of the, the fix landed in the Linux kernel doesn't mean it's going to be landing in your Linux distro, right? So that's normally like a few years gap. I remember somebody did a statistic on, on the PR for Linux kernel. I think only a third of the PR actually gets merged into Linux kernel because the maintainers have a high bar, right, to get those fixes or new feature enhancement into and then it's kernel. So uh, eBPF really play a critical role here to allow you to easily extend uh, beyond what the kernel can offer and without needing to wait until the PR gets merged into the kernel, without needing to wait until it landed into your favorite Linux distro, uh, and then you have to upgrade to that version too. Um, eBPF is designed to be very safe. Uh, the code is verified 
certified uh, by the kernel uh, be, uh, as it's been loaded to make sure it doesn't crash, make sure it uh, doesn't harm the kernel. That's why it's running within the sandbox environment and it's supposed to be very fast uh, with uh, JIT compiled and native speed. Um, many of you probably using eBPF at one point. How many of you have used TCP dump? All right, I'd expect most of you, if not everybody, right? So that's the humble origin of uh, eBPF. Uh, eBPF these days have been used in a, a variety of user cases, right? Uh, folks start using eBPF uh, for security, to make sure the uh, certain communications are secure, um, for tracing observability, to observe what's going on. In fact, we're going to cover some of that in our lab. Uh, for network policy enforcement, right? Some of our most popular CNI, for example, Cilium, and even Calico recently also added ABPF support uh, to do network policy enforcement. Um, so, uh, a lot of functionality related to eBPF to inno innovate uh, around the kernel before the kernel has these functions. Uh, this is one of our favorite diagram around ABPF. It really explains uh, really well the difference between the user space and the kernel space, right? Typically, ABPF program has uh, a user program that allows you to generate the BPF uh, bytecode and to be able to load that bytecode into the kernel. And then once it's loaded into the kernel, on the kernel space, uh, kernel is going to verify. Remember we said our eBPF is designed to be safe, right? So there's a verifier, verify it will not uh, crash or harm the kernel. And then uh, you can attach your program to different hook points. Uh, so the kernel is going to attach to different hook points such as K-probe, U-probe, and trace points. And then um, part of the connectivity corridor between the kernel and the user program is the maps. The maps that you designed uh, to be relevant to your eBPF program. Uh, so the kernel would put some of the useful data you may need in the map and then the user program can read those maps and maybe display to you or log it out for you for whatever format you want to consume it. So uh, that's how, in a nutshell, the difference between user program and kernel program, kernel space program, and how they interact with each other. So uh, why is uh, this important, right? Uh, why is the eBPF so important? I think early on we kind of touch on the speed of innovation before your fixes, the features can be added to the kernel. Uh, the other thing about eBPF, it's really, uh, it's designed to accomplish some of the tasks that's not possible uh, to be done by outside of eBPF. Uh, before, for example, with IP tables, right, you have to kind of do a lot of stuff in the user space and also have some interaction with the kernel uh, program. So there are certain tasks and scaling issues related to that. And eBPF is also designed to, uh, for multiple personas, right? So from an application developer to uh, SRE to uh, developer engineer and network operators, uh, eBPF, have a role in there, right? Application developers can write uh, eBPF programs uh, for uh, developer engineer and the SIE to consume, maybe, for example, observe uh, what's going on within the kernel and some of the uh, kernel programs. Uh, and the network operator can use eBPF programs to enforce uh, network policies. So uh, it has a wide range of benefits to different personas. Um, if you have ever started eBPF program, the first resource you probably run into is uh, the BCC. Uh, you build your first eBPF program using uh, with BCC. How many of you actually tried to write a simple eBPF program before? Awesome. Yeah. Were you using BCC or something else? Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, BCC is a uh, Linux um, BCC BPF tracing tool. So it has a bunch of uh, toolkit that you can use and you can call. It's, uh, it's the first uh, thing most people start to learn as they learn eBPF programs. Uh, one challenging, I, I also went through this two years ago. Uh, I find out that using an eBPF program with the original BCC tools, it's a little bit confusing. Um, essentially, you can most of the example shows how you can write uh, using a simple Python program. I think you can also write in C as well. But if you're using a Python program, essentially in that program, you're going to have the user space program and also the kernel program. And what's the difference though is the user space program is written in Python and then the kernel space program is written in C. You might be wondering how would that work, right? How would the compiler work? So what essentially has is the user pro uh, the kernel program written in C is kind of like a string. So that's how you know the Python treats it. So you can't do much validation or compiling uh, with your compiler with that uh, kernel program in C using the Python compiler. Um, so during execution of your simple eBPF program, uh, typically it calls uh, the clown uh, LLVM, which performs a kernel header lookup, you know, check if it's the right uh, kernel version, and then compile your code at runtime, which is very expensive, right? Because it's resource heavy. Uh, you actually, before you run it, you have to compile it uh, right at runtime. So this is uh, very resource heavy, especially in the production environment. Um, now, the newer ones that comes just recently in the most recent few years is building your eBPF program with BPF CORI. CORI stands for compile once, run everywhere. So what this means is if the developer actually write an eBPF program and then make it offer to you to run it, you don't have to compile it, uh, compile it, right? So uh, it uh, would uh, compile it ahead of the, uh, the developer can compile it for for you and then you just take the binary to run it. Uh, it also provides uh, a DBP, DBPF as a user space BPF loader uh, uh, it, so you can use it as a library to load your eBPF program. It continues using uh, Clang as the compiler and uh, it has uh, BPF type information in, uh, in the VM Linux headers. Um, so this means the kernel and user space program are both written in C and uh, you can execute it on any system. Uh, While well, the gosh is the system has to uh, on a particular version that supports uh, BPF Cori. I think it's the next kernel uh, 5.6 uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that. So do a little bit of Google search, you'll know for sure. Uh, I think it's 5.6. Um, so now the next question is, that, okay, so you still have to write user program, user space and also uh, the kernel code, right? Imagine what if you only write the kernel program, so you don't have to worry about the user space code, right? Would that be possible? So this is where uh, I want to introduce an open source project called uh, Bumblebee. So if you go to ebpf.io uh, slash applications, uh, which we took a screenshot of that, you, uh, that website and that list uh, essentially lists all the eBPF uh, open source projects out there. Uh, Bumblebee is a project started at solo.io, which we contribute to the open source ecosystem uh, to help user to uh, learn eBPF and also bring the Docker-like experience to our eBPF developers. So how does it work? So essentially uh, with Bumblebee, you can, by the way, you can visit bumblebee.io uh, to visit our website. You can build eBPF program uh, and build it as OCI images and then you can also publish 
your eBPF programs as uh, the, the OCI images into any uh, OCI compliant registries. And then you can also run uh, your eBPF program as OCI uh, images using OWA runner. So that's exactly the favorite Docker experience you guys are familiar with, right? So you build your images, uh, you push to the registry, and then you can run your Docker images. So that's why we we believe what Bumblebee really provides to the eBPF uh, community is this uh, Docker-like experience to you, for you to learn and build and publish, and uh, for uh, maybe your other friends and families and co-workers to consume your eBPF programs. So uh, at the nutshell, Bumblebee helps you to build, run, distribute your eBPF programs as OCI images. Uh, also, last not the least, Bumblebee can also expose the events as metrics for you. So you can hook it up with premises and potentially even visualize your metrics uh, uh, with other observability systems. System. Uh, Bumblebee leverages uh, the libbpf uh, kernel space code and take uh, uh, existing uh, libbpf kernel space code into metrics. Uh, that's how uh, the metrics works, which we will also cover in the lab. In the lab. Uh, right now, Bumblebee relies on the Cori uh, we were just talking about. Uh, BPF Cori, so you have to uh, use Bumblebee on relative newer Linux kernel uh, that supports uh, Cori. All right, uh, so let's talk about how you could potentially migrate some of the existing eBPF program that was originally written to work with BCC to uh, leave BPF and work with Bumblebee. Um, so uh, in the lab, we're going to talk about uh, OMKIL, out of memory KIL uh, program. So in this program, uh, remember we talk about with BCC, you typically have the um, user space code, right? You also have the kernel space code. So the first program is the user space, and the second one is the kernel uh, space code. Um, also, uh, in this program, originally it was written to use hash map, which is not as performed as uh, ring buffer. So we're going to take a little bit small surgery to the program to migrate the hash map to ring buffer. Um, and also, uh, it was the initial was using the perf buffer, and then we're going to also migrate to ring buffer. This is because uh, ring buffer is. Uh, uh, this is because ring buffer is more performant. Um, all right, let's uh, take a little bit, uh, dive into perf buffer versus ring buffer, right? From a resource usage perspective, ring buffer allows you to use shared buffer. So it, uh, instead of using buffer per CPU, it, you can use shared buffer, so it's more, uh, it, it can be saving you some resources. Uh, from an event ordering perspective, um, the BPF events, uh, the events from the kernel sometimes have uh, milliseconds of delay. When you have multiple CPU running, sometimes uh, it could be a little bit out of ordering. So with shell buffer, you no longer have that problem, uh, even when you have multiple CPU. Um, Ring buffer also provide a nice uh, reserve and submit API, um, so that's uh, pretty easy and developer-friendly to use. And the only requirements is the Linux 5.8. So I probably said it wrong um, on the requirements earlier. Yeah, so 5.8 is the requirements to use uh, Rim Buffer. Uh, if you're interested in the details, check out the links. So let's uh, jump into the workshop. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a quick overview of the workshop. So the first one, we're going to build and deploy eBPF applications uh, with Bumblebee, right? So we're going to build the application using Bumblebee and then push it to the OCI registry, and then we're going to run the programs. And then we're also going to explore the kernel events and view it in the Prometheus uh, UI. So you can view the metrics uh, that we've collected for you through Bumblebee. Um, 
I think it's the third lab we're going to de debug and depose, uh, compose multiple kernel space code uh, and ship them as a single OCI image. So we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons why you want to combine uh, multiple eBPF programs into a single um, single OCI image. And uh, then we're going to uh, jump into some of the libbpf helpers, which we probably don't have time, uh, which is the last lab. All right, let's get started uh, with the lab. So what I want you to do, if you do have a computer, go to uh, bit.ly bit slash develop dash ebpf dash apps. So uh, which when you click on this link, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to ask you for your user and uh, username, uh, company, and uh, email uh, that we can send you additional information about the program. And also, if you do a, a certification badge, which is completely free, we can send a badge to you as well. So once you provide that information, you should be able to get into this view. Uh, which have the content of the lab. Uh, by the way, a gentleman there uh, from Newstack uh, was just asking me if, uh, if he doesn't have a Linux machine, can he still do the lab? So the answer is yes. Uh, if you don't have a Linux machine, what the lab does, by the way, let me click on the stop button first. Uh, so what the lab does is uh, we basically contract a third company, Instruct, uh, which we pay for them to uh, provision VMs in different clouds. So they are smart enough to think out uh, which cloud have resources that's close to you and then uh, deploy a virtual machine for you. So you essentially, as long as you have a browser, you are interactive with a virtual machine in the cloud. Uh, and then that virtual machine would have the right uh, Linux version for you. Is that a question? Oh, yes, the, the link, yes, uh, let me do that, great question. Yeah, so bit.ly slash develop dash ebpf dash apps. Um, yeah, let me uh, launch it on both screens so you guys have it too. I can also monitor here. All right, yeah. Okay, let me. So if you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, let me. We will wait uh, for a few minutes, just making sure everybody are uh, on. Um, we will make, wait a little bit, just making sure, you know, everybody have an environment. Um, the way the lab works is I will run the lab uh, live with you. Um, I know some people likes to do the lab uh, kind of as I was ta I'm talking, um, but you don't have to. At the end, we will give you a little bit time to do the lab if you prefer to. Um, to kind of watch me first and then do the lab yourself. Um, so uh, I, I, I will add a few minutes at the end, just making sure, because I know some people prefer to watch first and do the lab. All right, does everybody have the URL? Raise the hand if you still need the URL. All right, so it looks like everybody have it. I'm going to jump into the screen then. All right, so um, this is what you are going to see um, at the beginning after you type your information and click on the start button. Uh, you can click on the start uh, right here. That would jump right into the lab. So I'm going to wait uh, a little bit uh, as you guys have it.
All right, does everybody kind of click the stop button to kick off the environment? Yes? Uh, it's broken for you? Okay, let me. Um, yeah, the Wi Fi is very slow. Yesterday, I was in a room doing a live demo. I ended up using my hotspot. So, if you do have a hotspot, I would recommend you to use it. Uh, this Today, I learned my lesson, so I actually have a dedicated cable now. <laughs> so, but I'm, I don't think they can offer that to everybody. But if you do have a hotspot, uh, I would highly encourage you to use it. The Wi Fi, it is very slow. Huh? Oh, so do you also have a problem? Okay, so I think that I think the Wi-Fi is a little bit intermittent. Uh, maybe it was uh, not so slow, but uh, it wasn't consistent to me. So, how many of you actually click on the stop button to get the environment going? All right. All right, so good luck for you guys, uh, folks. I'm going to get uh, started then as uh, some of you are waiting for environment. Okay, so in this lab, we're going to uh, detect out of memory kills with the help of eBPF. Um, is the size okay for folks in the back? Good? All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, out of memory manager, uh, the original dates back to the old days of Linux, right? And the out of me um, memory manager. So, when your instance uh, is running low on memory, um, older, pa uh, older pages will be reclaimed, right? If this is not possible, a function called out of memory will be called. Uh, to uh, with a single task, basically to avoid running out of memory. Uh, in the case of Kubernetes, um, the basic uh, um, out of memory also exists, right? So if you are running, I come from a cloud native environment, so in Kubernetes, uh, sometimes we see uh, out of memory um, pods go out of memory, and uh, you know Kubernetes keep restarting the pods. So that's also because pod uh, reaches the limit for the container and uh, um, or maybe the node the pod is running gets overcommitted. So monitoring out of memory events, it's actually really critical, right? So because that enables you to operate your workloads reliably and making sure you're giving the right uh, CPU request and uh, reserve the right CPU and memory for, for your pods or applications. Uh, catching out of memory, on the other hand, is uh, not trivial. Uh, this is where eBPF can help. So in this example, uh, we are going to first take a look at the upstream eBPF tools uh, from BCC, uh, which they have uh, out of memory scripts. So uh, this is the code, uh, which is really, really simple. It has a basic uh, struct, um, and uh, inside of the struct is have a a a, a perf um, perf event, and uh, it has uh, the key and value for it. And, uh, and it's hooking up to the out of memory uh, kill process. So whenever there is a out of memory uh, kill process um, events happening, it's going to try to log the, the process ID, the group ID, and the pages. Uh, when that happens, uh, the, the pages being used by the program, and then kind of write the contents out into the map. Um, so that's essentially uh, what this program does. The kernel version is very, very simple. Uh, if you actually go to the user space uh, 
portion of this program, it's actually not so simple because uh, it has to, you know, load the code uh, in the eBPF code into the kernel. It has to handle the events. It all has also to think out. Um, ha have to also think out how to uh, print it out, or you know, give some output to the user, so user can think out well uh, which program has the out of memory. Uh, so, so that's uh, the the basic uh, uh, code about out of memory kill for the EVPF program. Uh, so. Um, in this example, since we're working with uh, Bumblebee, right? So what we are going to do is uh, we're going to uh, not using the user space program, which uh, we just showed that's more than 100 lines of code. It's a little bit more complicated. And what Bumblebee does is kind of save you from writing the need to write a uh, user space program code, right? So you can focus on the kernel code. So. Um, Let's get started. So um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, download the out of memory kill uh, BPF program from uh, the BCC website. So once it's download, uh, I am going to look at the difference uh, between the out of memory kill program and also a program, uh, the same program that we modified for Bumblebee, which is in the data slash steps slash omkio uh, directory. So this would show you uh, the difference uh, between the two program, which the primary difference is around um, the changing from um, that we covered early on, uh, the change from perf buffer to rim buffer because uh, rim buffer is supported by Bumblebee and also it's uh, more performant uh, than perf buffer. So uh, if I launch the program with Wim, hopefully it's a little bit easy for you to read and for me to read too. Um, yeah, so on the left side, it's the uh, Omkio eBPF program we downloaded from the BCC uh, site. On the right side is our new uh, eBPF program, which is also OMKIL, um, but it's uh, optimized to use the RIM buffer. Uh, so let's go over the difference quickly. Um, I think uh, for the include, uh, we skipped that because uh, what we included was simple, so we just inline it in the code here on the right side uh, as a struct. And uh, uh, the key difference on this structure here is uh, it was using perf uh, buffer. Now we're changing it to use uh, rim buffer. So as you can see, um, the perf buffer, um, we, we, we are using, uh, with rim buffer, we're using max entries and also the value of the, uh, of the data. Uh, one thing about uh, the struct I want to point out is we actually changed the name of the struct. Before it's called events, uh, now we call it omkill. And the reason we do that is because when you have a meaningful struct name, uh, Bumblebee can show it much easier so you know which, um, uh, where is the metrics come from, from which, uh, which map. And Bumblebee supports uh, uh, map.counter, uh, which is what we are using. I believe Bumblebee also supports map.gouge, uh, uh, but for now, counter fits our purpose. And uh, scroll down a little bit uh, into uh, the BPF uh, K-probe um, method. Uh, the change is um, essentially just uh, switching from perf buffer to rim buffer. As you can see, we've been, uh, with rim buffer, you can reserve uh, what you need, which is really nice. And uh, you can then uh, submit. So that's the reserve and submit API uh, we talk about. Uh, the other differences, I think we are working with a pointer here uh, for the struct. So that's uh, some of the semantics are a little bit different uh, on how to uh, read the data. Um, all right, so that's uh, the key difference uh, between the two. Uh, what I'm going to do next 
is I'm going to exit out of the two, uh, the WIM div, and uh, uh, we're going to do, um, and uh, what we're going to do is install Bumblebee. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let me make sure I didn't miss any steps. All right. So uh, to install Bumblebee, it's really simple. So you can uh, download Bumblebee from our website, uh, the latest version, uh, and uh, and then you can put it into your user being local directory. So Bumblebee is in your pass. Um, now. Um, what we're going to do next is uh, we are going to uh, remember we reviewed the data steps omkl and omkl.c program so we're going to copy that program to the local directory so that we can easily build it uh, with bumblebee remember we talked about bumblebee can help you build abpf program so much easier so right now we're running b build um, program to build uh, the particular program, eBPF program, omkill.c. And then we're going to say, you know, I want to build it for uh, as this image name so that um, I can push it to my registry, which I happen to have a registry local. All right, so right now it's compiling the eBPF program using Cori. Uh, that we talked about earlier. So this has a dependency on libbpf and also relies on a newer version of Linux kernel 5.8. And you can see it successfully compiled the program. And uh, yeah, and it did uh, create this OCI images for us. Uh, the next thing we can do is uh, let's go ahead and push the OCI images into our local registry, which runs on localhost 5000. Yeah, we did push it into our local registry. Now we should be able to run it. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, so this is the Bumblebee simple UI. So what this UI essentially shows you is display the omkio. Remember that was a struct. That's the ring buffer in our program. It's going to display everything going on within that uh, that ring buffer. So right now we don't have any out of memory events. So let's generate some. So in order for us to generate uh, out of memory uh, events, what we are going to do is uh, leveraging uh, we're going to try to run this uh, in Kubernetes. So, um, um, so we're going to deploy a daemon set. So first, we're going to deploy Bumblebee into um, into our Kubernetes cluster as a daemon set, and uh, inside of this, um, we're going to configure to run without the UI. Well, which is this node-tty, and we're also going to configure to run this eBPF uh, OCI images we just built, omkio version 1. And uh, we're going to configure to, as a daemon said, it's going to deploy into every single node of my Kubernetes cluster, which you can see I have three nodes, right? Two worker and one master. Uh, so let's go ahead and deploy this daemon set into my Kubernetes cluster. And if you do uh, get pause, you should be able to see the status of Bumblebee. Oh, it's rich running already. Okay, so looks like our daemon set is deployed. Um, um, the next thing we're going to do is install permissives, right? Remember we said uh, Bumblebee can help you generate metrics automatically. In this case, it would generate metrics related to Omkio. So uh, we're going to uh, install permissives so you can view these metrics in permissives. So we're going to use Helm to install cube permissives stack, uh, which have the entire uh, stack of permissives. And uh, what Helm does is essentially, you know, uh, download the right uh, chart and uh, install it as uh, Kubernetes deployment services inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So if you run get pass dash A again, 
you can see right now it's having a bunch of uh, premises related contents right because we install the the entire um, premises stack um, all right so now what we need is actually the pod that can generate out of memory right so uh, actually but before we do that we need to have a pod monitor to scrape or uh, bumblebee pods uh, so the metrics can be scraped properly in premises. Um, so let's go ahead and deploy the pod monitor. Um, so as you can see the pod monitor is configuring uh, slash metrics and every 15 seconds and uh, it's uh, scraping the bumblebee pods which has app uh, equals bumblebee as the label. All right, now uh, let's go ahead and check Permissus UI, right? So right now we don't have any data to curate yet. Uh, that's because we don't have any events uh, related to OMKIL. So uh, now we need to finally decide, uh, deploy a test application. Uh, so in this test application, we're using a memory leak uh, can image from AWS solution and uh, we purposely fully set uh, a very small request and limits on the memory, right? So it's 64 meg and 128 meg. And uh, because this uh, image, uh, the container runs this image, is going to continue to leak uh, memory. So it's going to hit out of memory pretty fast in theory. All right, so we got this guy uh, installed. Let's take a look at the pods on the Kubernetes system. So you can see um, we already have uh, out of memory killed events and uh, we also have a restart. So essentially what Kubernetes does is uh, it, uh, you know, it have uh, detected the out of memory kill events and also try to restart the pod to see if it can recover after restart, right? So uh, now if we go back to um, the Bumblebee UI, you can actually see some events actually happening, which is super cool, right? So it actually tells you um, the, the PID ID of, uh, of uh, the process that's uh, causing out of memory. It also tells you how many uh, pages it was using when out of memory events was generated. What about premises? Can I view the metrics in premises? So um, let's go ahead uh, to see if we can query over premises. Uh, so let's see. Um, all right, so this is the expression box and let's execute the OMKL events. So uh, you can see, remember that uh, eBPF uh, ohm kills uh, that um, ring buffer name we gave, right? So that's how you know when you have multiple uh, ring buffer or maps, that's how you know this is related to ohm kill. So it's important to give a meaningful name and it captures uh, the problematic part, right? So it says uh, this, uh, Bumblebee um, uh, container is reporting uh, in the default namespace, uh, it's reporting this, um, this uh, program called stress and this is the PID ID of the program and this is the page, uh, memory page when it has the problem. So it captures all that information for you, which is super cool. And if you see right now, we have one, two, three, five of them. And if you do a pause here, we have four of them and four restarts. So that matches uh, five of uh, out of memory here. It also matches uh, what you see on the UI, which is also five of them. Uh, all right, so that's how uh, the OMKIOS uh, program works in action. Uh, so what we did is uh, we kind of uh, move, uh, we kind of using B program to uh, build 
uh, the OMKIA program, we changed uh, slightly updated for Bumblebee. Uh, so this is uh, without the needing to have user space code. So we build the program, we push to registry, we run it. We also deploy uh, the Bumblebee in Kubernetes we, as a daemon set and uh, we kind of uh, deploy premises and premises part monitor for Bumblebee so it can report uh, metrics and scripts uh, endpoints and reports uh, the out of memory uh, events uh, metrics on the premises um, so you can see it on the UI. With that, I'm going to wait a few minutes so you guys can do the lab as well. Questions? Yeah, so I think if I heard the question correctly, uh, is what does Bumblebee offer uh, that Prometheus didn't? Okay, what is Prometheus offering that Bumblebee didn't offer, right? So uh, in this example, um, we run Bumblebee by itself, right? Which I didn't have to, in fact, uh, we kind of ride on the because um, oh, our Kubernetes is also running on this particular node, on this particular VM. That's how we were able to observe out of memory events, right? So essentially what Bumblebee provides is the ring uh, buffer that captures these events from the kernel, right? Uh, what Prometheus provides is uh, to be able to scrape uh, these, uh, these endpoints and be able to kind of get it on the UI so you can view them, right? So Prometheus would not have in these um, metrics without Bumblebee. Yeah, so um, in theory though, uh, you don't need both, right? In my example, I happened to launch Bumblebee because I was showing you guys how to run Bumblebee, but um, in this example, like we could, for instance, right now, I killed my other Bumblebee uh, right, right now we have five restarts, so that means I'm expecting six metrics. So if I do an execute here, I have six metrics. So you will know without the other Bumblebee program, you know, I can still visualize uh, everything in premises. That's because I'm actually running Bumblebee inside of my Kubernetes cluster. Remember, uh, we kind of took Bumblebee as a daemon set, we deploy it in Kubernetes cluster, and then when we launch uh, the Bumblebee um, daemon set, we said, I want you to run this OMKL eBPF program as you run Bumblebee, and I don't want you to run the UI for the Bumblebee because Bumblebee UI takes resources uh, for you. So yeah, so that's uh, what it happens. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I'm thinking you can just run Bumblebee anyway. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. I just happened to show it to show how you can easily run it without Kubernetes. Yeah, but in, if you are working with Kubernetes environment, I would definitely recommend you just run it in Kubernetes. It's just so much easier. All right, that's folks. Uh, one more question. So, uh, so 5.8 should work uh, with Bumblebee. The older ones, uh, I think that's when it's having problems. So if you go to uh, Bumblebee website, I think uh, Bumble, if I can type, I think uh, we document the version uh, right on the website, hopefully somewhere. Uh, let me see. Okay, first step. Um, yeah, the reason why older version would not work is right now uh, when we initially wrote uh, Bumblebee, it only works with the kernel that supports uh, Cori, uh, and Cori has a version limitation. Um, we just didn't feel because that's the future, right? So we didn't want to support older version uh, with our limited resource. Let me see if I can find the version requirements. 
I'm surprised uh, we don't have it on the site here. But uh, yeah, definitely um, uh, it depends on the LibBPF toolkit, um, uh, the core exists, which I believe is 5.8. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, do you guys need more time or should I continue? Question or continue? All right, I think the question is how can we measure the impact of eBPF program on the kernel? Is there any measurement tools for that? Um, that's a great question because uh, I, I think right now you can, like when I run it in Kubernetes, you can measure, you know, how much your pods are using and all that, but that's not that's, that's not counting the portion that's loaded into the kernel. Um, I actually don't know the answer for that. Uh, I have to get back to you. Does somebody in the audience know the answer for that? All right. <laughs> I think that's a very good question. So, um, So hopefully, uh, I do have a, a Christian uh, is also online, so hopefully you can uh, tell us the answer. Christian actually wrote uh, the workshop and uh, he has, uh, unfortunately he had a surgery, so couldn't be there uh, in person. So hopefully he knows the answer for this question. All right, um, I am going to continue given the time. So uh, once you finish the lab, click on the green uh, check button. Uh, just, I think it does a sanity check, just making sure you are in the right stage. Uh, then we can continue with uh, the next uh, challenging. So raise your hand, uh, you have finished the first lab. Excellent. Your, I'm sorry, did you say your screen is blocked? No, no, my screen is not blocked, but I wasn't able to uh, have a face like my own. Anyway, go, go up the page, just like shift and start if you want to like to face with the button. Yeah, thank you. I know on different operating system, it's, uh, it's different. So thank you for that. I typically Windows user always have problems because <laughs> they are copy pastes different. Did you say the answer is shift and? Okay, so shift and insert is the magic for Windows. Okay, yeah, shift and insert if you're, you're working with the Windows environment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's load in the next one. Uh, in this one, we are going to. Um, learn a little bit about debugging eBPF code. So I'm going to click on start our button here and uh, we are getting started on this. Okay, I did, uh, by the way, just to answer uh, the question that gentleman had, uh, um, Christian did uh, provide me some feedback, thank you. Um, he said uh, the eBPF program are very lightweight. The overhead is like one to two percent in terms of CPU. Bumblebee will consume a few hundred of megabytes uh, because it handles user space as well. So that's uh, that's typically how it works. Um, And he also mentioned the older one will only work in the program is the older one working in the program is using hash map as ream buffer needs 5.8. So if you are using older one that supports Cori, you would have to use uh, hash map if that answers your question on that. 
All right. Um, Okay, so in this lab, we're going to go with uh, Open Snoop as an example. Uh, we will learn about debugging eBPF program uh, using Open Snoop as an example. So, um, so what does Open Snoop do? Open Snoop traces uh, open system calls in your system. So with Open Snoop, you can easily check uh, where your application think, where your configuration files are. Uh, if you have been into a situation you couldn't find the logs of your application, Open Snoop can help there too. Um, so let's get familiar with the code. So uh, first, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, the BCC uh, repository to download the open uh, BPF code uh, using wget. And uh, we're going to uh, take a look of the difference between open uh, we downloaded, which is on the left side, to the debug program on the right side, uh, which is provided uh, by this lab. So uh, this shows the difference. And uh, let's sort of take a look at the difference using WIM because it's just so much easier to look. So if you type uh, WIM diff, uh, that would highlight the difference. So you can see uh, the Bumblebee open sleuth uh, is leverage a rim buffer uh, instead of a perf buffer uh, in this example here. Uh, so this is rim buffer, this is perf buffer on the left side, right on the left side is what's downloaded from BCC. And uh, um, the, the F name, I believe, is the, the name of the program, and the PID is the PID of the program. So um, this is, um, and then we are, uh, config a max entry, which is same as uh, the other program. Um, Right, let's check out the key difference here. Oh, one thing about uh, a key difference is uh, in the initial program, it has a trace allowed method, which uses uh, filters. Um, this Bumblebee doesn't have kernel side filtering support yet. So what we did is uh, we essentially uh, skip uh, that method uh, in that function in our uh, Bumblebee version of the program. Uh, the other thing we did is, um, okay, in the open, so in the, tra uh, in the open method, the trace point open method, uh, essentially the key differences are using, uh, using the ring buffer in this case, uh, and also uh, trace allowed because it's not supported in Bumblebee, so we removed that portion. And uh, same as open net, uh, we remove the trace allowed uh, portion. And uh, in the trace exit, uh, we are using the reserve and submit API to work with the ring buffer. Um, yep, that's pretty much the high level differences here. So with that, I am going to get out of uh, um, the, the WIM diff program. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to copy this debug program to uh, the current directory so we can easily build it uh, with Bumblebee. So uh, to build with Bumblebee, we just run bbuild uh, command, uh, which would uh, build this into an OCI image that we specified here. And uh, it's compiling and it's building the image. In. Let's go ahead and push this image to the OCI registry, uh, which is local here, host here. Um, now we can go ahead and run this program. So in, when we run this program, notice here uh, we specify dash F. In this case, uh, we particularly want to uh, reduce uh, the noise uh, by filter. Um, so we're going to use uh, this uh, to filter uh, these uh, events, com and core uh, DNS, uh, just to show these. So let's go ahead and uh, run these. Uh, right now, we don't have any events, but hopefully uh, some events will come in. 
I think you can uh, easily generate some events if you're getting uh, Kubernetes pods here. Uh, so, uh, all right, so we do have some events coming in now. Um, okay, so we have events uh, related to core DNS. So what we're going to do is let's validate if these events are correct. So um, if you, you run a PS uh, AUX to show the list of the process and the graph core DNS, you can find out, okay, this is the core file and this is running on 5051. So if we go here, uh, look at our uh, core file, notice here it's using a different PID number um, so it's 5098 or 5096, which is quite different than what we see here. So something is going on that's not quite right. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the, the code, right? So in order for us to look at the code, uh, one thing we can do is maybe add some debug statement. Um, so let's go ahead. Uh, so you can use the VI or uh, you can also use the file editor to add um, uh, to add uh, the debug statement here. So let's see, the files we're working with is OpenSoup. Uh, let me hit refresh button. Yeah, and we're working with OpenSnoop uh, B, uh, BPF program, that's C, right? So um, so now the first thing we I want to do, actually, is this the right file? Let me just verify. This looks different. Okay, yeah, this is the file. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is in the open net, uh, uh, method, we're going to do some printing, just making sure our PID ID, because the PID ID is what's having problems. Uh, so we're going to making sure our PID ID is correct. So uh, instead of here, uh, we are going to add a print statement and uh, making sure it's right and then save it. Let's see what else should we add. Okay, in the trace ad, uh, exit, let's also print out the PID ID, right? Because that's the one having the problem. Uh, so, all right, so let's make sure um, well to add it. Okay, right after the mime copy and uh, right before I think we uh, emit the events. Um, all right, uh, so in the trace exit, um, okay, it's open exit event data. Okay, get current PID. Um, perf event. All right, why am I not finding the MIME copy here? Uh, let me see if I can search for it. MIME CPY. All right. Um, let me make sure this is the right file. Uh, root. Okay. So if I go here, uh, let me make sure the folder I am in. Okay. So the image. Oh, okay. So it's open snook C. That's why. <laughs> That's the name I copy. Sorry about that. All right. So okay. So in the open net, let's do this one more time. Uh, okay. So this is the one we want to do uh, in the open net after the PID number. Let's want to print this out, and uh, also in the trace exit right before um, right before we submit the event to Rim Buffer. Uh, we also want to print out uh, the trace exit uh, for that. All right. Okay, so we got it. Um, let's go ahead, save it. Um, 
All right, so uh, right after you save it, uh, one thing to do is, <laughs> actually didn't do this yesterday, so it's make sure you build the program one more time, right, to pick up the change. So uh, to build the program, you run B build, and uh, you can then push it to the registry so you can run it easily. Now, if we do run the program now, uh, using the same command, uh, hopefully, um, right now we are going to get a little bit more data uh, from from the the trace uh, pipe file uh, to see. All right. Uh, yeah, something is coming in. So the core the uh, the core DNS. Uh, oh look, Notice there's an interesting thing going on. The open net and trace exit is actually using different PID number, right? That's odd. I would imagine it's the same PID number for, for both, right? Because it's using the same, uh, it's the same call, right? To open and exit. Um, so something maybe it's going odd here. This maybe also explains why we are, you know, having different, um, the, not the correct number, the PID number showing up here, right? So because um, we might be showing the one that's incorrect. Um, so let's think out what's going on here. Um, all right, so let's take a look at how we handle PID number in, in either places, just making sure. Uh, which one is right. Um, so this is the PID number we are getting the current PID in trace exit. Uh, this is open net, we're getting the current PID. Okay, I see the difference now. The difference is uh, this guy has a shift uh, 32, um, right shift 32 places uh, to get rid of the thread uh, group ID. Uh, well, the other one does not, right? So in order to fix this, uh, what we are going to do is uh, to fix this, all we need to do is uh, shift it um, by 32 um, like the other one, right? So let me see. Uh, so in here, instead of having um, event.pid, uh, using BPF get current um, PID uh, here. Let's go ahead, shift it uh, by 32 like uh, the other one. So hopefully with that, we will get consistent results between open net and exit. Let's go ahead, click on save button to save it. And uh, last thing we also need to do is uh, let's go ahead, build it, right? So we need to build the program and we need to push it and then we need to run it, right? All right, we got it running. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is let's open up our debugging command uh, to look at the trace pipe, just making sure they are consistent. Okay, so this might be from the older one. Um, let's see, 5.0.51. Okay, this is the new one. So you can see it's consistent now. And uh, if we do run the other command, um, hopefully that's okay. Yeah, that's also 5051. So that's uh, consistent now. So, and also it's consistent as what you are seeing here uh, as the PID number. So that means this uh, debugging session is working. We find out uh, the problem where it is. Um, we were able to, you know, print out uh, more additional debugging information. Unfortunately, with eBPF, the debugging information print is uh, pretty original that you can't do a debugger easily. So you just uh, print out the problematic uh, uh, thing and then you compile the traces. And then once we make the code change, yeah, we take the code to Bumblebee to have the B command to recompile the code, republish the image, and then we rerun the images. So that shows the whole life cycle of things. 
Uh, with that, I'm going to click on the chat button and give you guys a few minutes to um, either ask questions or um, finish it, uh, the second lab. Uh, question? Yeah, I think you're just asking for clarifications that uh, we basically build images locally and then the image is tagged as localhost 5000, right? Which is uh, uh, the prefix for the local registry and then we push the image to the local registry and in the Kubernetes cluster, we also config the Kubernetes cluster to use the local registry. That's how you can uh, either run locally using B run with the, with the image name, uh, which points you to the local registry, or you can run it in your Kubernetes cluster by um, pointing to run with that particular images, uh, which your Kubernetes knows because it's configured to use that registry. Um, so that's what's shown here. Uh, you could potentially do is using the like, Google registry, any other OCI compliant registry, or you set up your own registry um, and then push it there. The only reason we showed local hosts is local hosts is easy in a lab format, but you don't have to use it. The idea of Bumble is really designed to use um, with any other OCI compliant registry that's already been out there. Your uh, DevOps pipeline might already be familiar with, um, so provide that consistent experience for you that you're already familiar with. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, All right, great question. Thank you so much. All right, Christian also just confirmed what I said was correct, so that's good. <laughs> All right, uh, the, do you guys need a few more minutes or you guys are ready to go to the next, the last lab? Good? Good? All right, sounds like most folks are good. I will continue then because uh, we, we have about um, 19 minutes. So I want to make sure I explore the labs and um, all right, so this in this lab, we're going to explore advanced user cases by chaining multiple eBPF program together um, and uh, with Bumblebee, right? So before we uh, start the lab, I want to kind of uh, talk about, you know, why you want to do that, right? Should you do that, right? Uh, so the good, the good way is, of course, you can do that, which opens the option. But on the, on the bad side, it opens the decision tree for you, right? Should you do something like that? Because how many of you use uh, monolithic applications in your in your workplace where you might be having like a lot of function within a single application. So imagine you have um, checkout, imagine you have your UI, and uh, imagine you have your business logic um, portion of your application all in one single application. Right, so that's monolithic, uh, which we we have before we come to cloud native. We break uh, the monolithic into microservices. So uh, monolithic has its own problem, right? Because it doesn't deliver very fast. It's not very agile. There's a lot of coordination, <laughs> and uh, you have to do and uh, just to get a release. So it typically takes a lot longer to get a release out. Um, so with eBPF, chaining multiple eBPF programs, you would also have to consider that this eBPF program fits naturally. Do they perform similar functions? Are they owned by 
different teams. So the people perspective is also very important, right? Because we talk about coordination, delivery speed. So that's uh, super important. You have to think about, does it make sense to combine into uh, chaining multiple eBPF program into one? So it really depends on your business need, uh, your organization structure, and the functionality of the, those eBPF programs. So in this lab, we assume you already done the study and the test. You are convinced that you do want to consolidate and chaining these two ABPF programs together. And we want to show you how to do that and uh, do it with Bumblebee. All right, uh, looks like I just got a connection close error. That's not great. <laughs> All right, I just refresh it. Hopefully that fix it. Um, so, um, so this time we are going to go through some code. Uh, we will, so basically we will combine two small eBPF program and we're going to deploy it as a single OCI image. Uh, created by Bumblebee. So uh, the first program uh, uh, we're going to take a look is uh, this uh, uh, exit and uh, exact dot C. And uh, let's check out the contents, comments of the code to see what it's doing. Uh, I should have this uh, in the data steps if I want to. Okay, let's find out. It might be easy to view it here. Data steps advanced, exit, exit, dot C. Awesome. All right, so um, what it's doing in this program is, uh, okay, we want to know the details for the exact course, so we kind of have a struct for it. We also want to know the detail for the exit cost. So we created another struct for it. Uh, we also uh, created a ring buffer to the exact events and we give a meaningful name and we're using counter here. And uh, we're using um, ring buffer here. Uh, notice we're using the same uh, same type uh, ring buffer here uh, for the exit events also, and uh, we're calling it exit events uh, with the same type and also uh, with the counter. It's just different names, um, but same type of ring, uh, same type uh, ring buffer, um, and then and then this is our exact uh, hook point. Uh, well, we attach the logic to all the system uh, exact uh, enter exact costs. Uh, essentially, what we have is we reserve uh, the size uh, space we need for the exact events, and then we populate uh, with the PID ID, uh, the name of the process, and uh, you know, and then we submit the the exact event. Um, so that it could potentially be used by any user space code, uh, for example, Bumblebee. Um, and then similarly for the exit event, uh, we are attaching this logic to the exit trace point cause. So um, this is a very similar code where we reserve the space for the exit events and we also submit uh, the data into the ring buffer uh, map. Um, and, with, and then before that, of course, we populate uh, the exit code, signal, uh, and also the name of the process. So you have that in the map, um, in, in the ring buffer, and potentially access it through our user space code, which is provided by Bumblebee. All right. Um, let's go back to our terminal. Uh, we didn't make any code change here. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, 
that's our combined uh, two eBPF program, right? We have we talk about there are uh, multiple ring buffer, there are uh, multiple hook um, attach uh, hook point uh, to the kernel. Now we are going to copy this program from uh, root data steps into uh, into the current directory. Uh, and then we're going to build an image from our code. All right, let's go ahead and push it. Uh, again, using local registry, but you don't have to use local registry. It can be any other OCI uh, compliant registry. The only thing is if you're using uh, a different registry, for example, you're using Google registry, you want to use the B tag command. Uh, which we'll show you a little bit here. So there is a tag command. So you can use a different name. So like Google Registry has uh, its own prefix. So you want to make sure you're using that before you push. Um, all right, let's go ahead and run this uh, image. As you can see, we have uh, the exact events and exit events, uh, both uh, of the uh, ring buffer map would display here. In the exact events, uh, we have some events coming in. Guess what those events are? It's probably me, right? I'm, as I was mentioned to you, this lab provides an environment in the cloud, right? The VM in the cloud and inside of the VM, we run our Kubernetes cluster using K3S, K3D, which is a really lightweight Kubernetes environment. So uh, with me interacting with um, K our K3S, you know, have shell terminals uh, and have Prometheus UI going on. So there's actually a bunch of exact events being logged uh, with the process ID. You can see it's different process ID. Um, now we don't have any any exit events because I haven't really done anything regarding exit, right? So. Um, so let's check out uh, the Permissus integration here. Um, so what we are going to do is uh, we're going to check out is there any metrics on the Permissus side. Um, that's interesting. So uh, 1991, I believe, is the default Permissus uh, ports for metrics. Uh, so if you grab all the eBPF metrics, which are produced uh, by Bumblebee with your eBPF program, which we are running here, you can see uh, a bunch of uh, exact events, uh, which is similar as what Bumblebee shows on here uh, between K3S and, uh, and Bash program, right? Um, now, if you search for uh, exact, uh, you see a bunch, but if you search for exit, uh, I don't think there's any exit. Let me, uh, let me make sure I don't miss it solo. Actually, I can just grab exit. It might be easy to type. Yeah, so there is nothing exit. So let's see if we can generate some ex exit events down the road too. Um, all right. so. Um, I know you guys probably a little bit confused, right? Okay, so we have this thing in Prometheus. We also have this uh, and in our Kubernetes cluster uh, with Bumblebee. We also have this Bumblebee UI. Oh, by the way, I just have an exit uh, coming. Oh, that's because I did a grab. Okay, awesome. So now if I do it, <laughs> I actually do have an exit and it actually report that's from the, the command uh, I run, right? Grab, which is very cool. So you can see our ABPF program is working by capture both exact and exit. And I should be able to see it here too. Uh, so very nice. <laughs> um, all right, so um, just talking really quickly about when you should use either one, right? The UI or running Bumblebee in Kubernetes. So I think the UI is really nice for demo and local development. It's very easy to see things, but it's not optimal for production environments. So the resource usage of the UI is much higher. And, uh, and also, it's harder for you to consume the output in a programmatic way, right? As human, we can read it. 
but <laughs> if you have some tool chain with it, you probably want to automate that, right? Generate alerts or, you know, send a text message to you. You know, you need some automation in place for that and UI is not a great for that. So this is really when you want to leverage uh, running Bumblebee in your Kubernetes cluster, leverage um, these premises uh, metrics so that you can efficiently consume the output of your scripts and use it in any automation system you have. And uh, remember at the beginning when we run Bumblebee, we run it with uh, no TTY. So that's essentially running Bumblebee without the UI. So you don't have to pay for the cost of the UI if you're not using it. Um, the other thing I want to quickly highlight, I know we highlight this before, it's just the naming really matters, right? So when we write these uh, uh, structs uh, for the ring buffer, right? We want to make sure give a meaningful name. This is important for metrics. Uh, you saw in permissives, right? Because if you do uh, permissives metrics here, if we are grabbing ABPF, you can see having this name so that you know exactly what's exit, what's uh, exact. It's just so helpful to you, uh, to you as you you know getting these um, getting these uh, data from the map uh, in your program to be able to leverage in your automation. So uh, that's uh, very critical to have. All right, so in this lab, uh, just a quick recap, uh, we showed how you can chain multiple eBPF program together and, uh, and we talk about how is this the right choice for you. Uh, only you uh, can tell us if that's the right choice for you and we also talk about uh, how to consider whether run Bumblebee in the UI was running in Kubernetes. So, you know, what are the considerations? Why would you use uh, which approaches? Uh, with that, I want to pause for a minute to see if you guys have any questions or uh, if you guys um, need any help. All right, I think we are getting close to the end of our session uh, for a few minutes. So the next lab is going to be uh, you're going to do it uh, if you're interested. Uh, we're going to check out some of the new uh, Leap BPF helpers uh, just to help you learn them. It's going to uh, supposed to make a transition to using uh, Leap BPF, um, eBPF program built on top of Leap BPF uh, much easier. So you're welcome to do the lab on your own. The environments will be up running for you in the next two or three days. Um, and I do want to mention one thing. Uh, so first of all, we have a certification badge, right? I know people love badges. So if you're interested in getting this particular badge, uh, you can scan that QR code and uh, it's going to challenge you on your eBPF knowledge, right? Uh, from what you learned from this lab. So um, if you go there, by the way, uh, which is going to bring you up the quiz. Uh, so I would really appreciate if you are interested in getting the badge. So go ahead and fill this out and uh, we'll let you know if you pass, right? We have your contact and, uh, and the, if you do pass, we are going to send you this badge. So uh, I encourage you to try to take the challenge. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, we are uh, hanging out at slack.solo.io. There is a Bumblebee channel if you're interested in to learn a little bit more about Bumblebee. If you, if you have questions, um, we will be there to answer questions for you. Check out bumblebee.io and uh, over GitHub. Uh, we certainly welcome you guys open issues and uh, you know contributing a PR that would be so much appreciated. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank you so much for attending and uh, I'll be here if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of uh, the conference. Could you show that quiz link? All right.
Yes, we have people interested in a quiz. Shout out to you. So I'm going to have the link here. If you want to take a screenshot, you will have the QR capture. Um, so yeah, so, you sh so the link, you can type it. Uh, I try to be easily remember. It's the develop eBPF apps dash quiz. And, uh, you know, you can scan the QR code, uh, do it on your phone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have to say, I really love you guys. You guys are very engaging. I really appreciate that. Yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I gave another talk. There was many questions, so I really appreciate you guys being very engaging. So, so much appreciated. You do have another question? That's a great question. I do think we have some of these images already, so you don't have to build it. I think it might be on Google registry. Uh, Christian, let me know if you know the answer. I'm going to try to find out. I'm pretty sure I've seen those images. Um, I just normally build it myself. Um, yeah, so basically the image we have is uh, in the Google uh, container registry. So we have our repository, uh, solo IO, Bumblebee, and then different program with our B version. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, great question. <laughs> All right, I think we're right on time. I will be here if you guys have more questions. Thank you so much for attending. Really appreciate your time and uh, Look forward to learning some eBPF together. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Bumblebee actually doesn't work with the BCC styles. So yeah, you can definitely use uh, the BPF trace. I think we showed it in the lab to print out some of the debugging statement. Yeah, so, so Bumblebee requires to use uh, the BPF uh, Cori, yeah, with the new uh, libbpf loader.